Rejoice, O highly favored one, for God is with you. That's what the angel said. I can't help but wonder if the first thought Mary had when the angel left was, I wish God didn't like me so much. (laughs) If this is what God with me looks like, I wish God would just leave me alone. Because in this place and at this time, there are few worse positions to be than female and unmarried and pregnant. When young women like this got pregnant, which undoubtedly happened with some frequency, regardless of what the law said, the community had words for those women. Loose. Delinquent. Other words that I won't repeat in polite company. It seems harsh and unfair to us, because it is, but that's what she would face if anyone found out the situation she was in. That reputation would follow her forever, but not just her. You see, before she's married, it's her father's job to keep an eye on her, to keep her from getting that reputation. Her growing belly will be a sign to everyone, family, friends, neighbors, the whole community, that her father has failed at his job. He would share her shame. His reputation would be forfeit now as well. How do you think he's going to respond to that? There's a good chance he might disown her. Then she would not only be young and unmarried and pregnant, she'd also be homeless and destitute as well. That's what's going through my mind as I read that she went with haste to Judea. Luke doesn't tell us, but he seems to imply that she's alone when she travels. That's not only dangerous for women to travel alone, it's also unseemly. But then who's she going to take with her? Her father? Her brothers? What would she tell them? The truth? You can imagine how well that would go over. Zechariah was a priest, and he didn't believe it when an angel from God told him that he would have a child in the usual way. (laughs) How is anyone going to believe a frightened teenager with every reason to lie about how she got pregnant? I wonder if that's why she decided to go see Elizabeth. Elizabeth is almost certainly not a first cousin. Any immediate extended family would have lived in or around Nazareth. But they must have been acquainted They must have known that they were related to each other, however distantly. If there's anyone who will believe her story and understand what's happening to her, it just might be Elizabeth. So Mary gets this message and goes with haste to visit some distant relative without anyone to accompany her. I don't know about you, but to me that sounds like she's running away. It sounds to me like she's desperate. And this is the best plan she can come up with. And so I think about Mary, young, pregnant, out of options, taking this huge risk to leave her family, possibly with no uh, word of where she's off to, to hope for kindness from a relative she doesn't know that well and probably hasn't seen in a long time. What do you think might be going through her head? What was she feeling? Can you imagine this young woman walking, whether alone or with a handful of strangers, for multiple days with all those thoughts and those emotions tumbling around in her head? What would she find when she reached Elizabeth's house? Would Elizabeth send Mary back to her father, where she'd have to explain why she left and what was happening? Would Elizabeth believe her? Would she face the same judgment she would have faced back home? I can only imagine that once she reached her destination and stood on the threshold of Zechariah's house, what emotions were on the threshold of her heart? I can only imagine what fear Worry, uncertainty she may have wrestled with all the way there. All of those things crowding around inside her, jostling for space in her heart as she reached out a hand to knock. And when Elizabeth opened the door and Mary greeted her, did her voice crack? Did all of those 
emotions and exhaustion from the trip finally get the best of her? For just a moment, did she wonder if she'd made a mistake in coming here? When Elizabeth does speak, the first word that she utters is the word bless. In Greek, it literally means good word. Where Mary had come from, there were no good words waiting for her. Only ugly, hurtful, accusatory words. Nobody there would have been happy to see her, not in the state that she's in. She was a disgrace. But Elizabeth is not only happy to see her, she knows. She knows that Mary is pregnant and she blesses that too. Mary is not a disgrace, not a curse. She is blessed. I wonder if Mary could respond to that right away. Or if she stood there for a moment, speechless, unable to make sense of what was happening. I wonder if the moment she knew that she didn't have to keep her guard up any longer, if it burst like a dam and all of that fear and frustration, all of that shame and anger and exhaustion that she'd been holding, for, holding up burst forth and, like a flood and poured out of her and found itself transmuted on her lips into this song of joy that we just sang. She's singing about herself, you know. She's the lowly one that's been lifted up. She's the hungry one who's been fed. She is the one who's found mercy. I wonder, does that moment of grace on Elizabeth's doorstep open her imagination to God's bigger picture? What I see in this story, in all of these stories today, is people looking at what's right in front of them and seeing something more. On its face, Luke's story is about a pregnant teenage runaway, alone and desperate. That's what Elizabeth saw when she opened her door. But somehow she also saw something else there. Somehow she knew God was there too. Nothing about what she saw in that doorway suggested God's presence. In fact, quite the opposite. God was entirely obscured in the darkness and the shame and the scandal of that story waiting on her porch. And yet somehow, Elizabeth knew. She couldn't see it, but she knew who was there. And that gets me thinking. I wonder if maybe this story doesn't invite us to look a little deeper too. To look more deeply at those people and those situations and those seemingly evil or terrible things in life uh, and wonder where God might be hiding in those things too. Mary's community had some ugly, nasty words to describe her. And I wonder, what are the ugly, nasty words that we still attach to people? Words that keep us from seeing the hidden blessing that they carry. Where might be God where might God be hiding in the terrible, in the frightening, in the shameful? Last week, we shuddered at John's harsh words of repentance and judgment. But this week, when Mary praises God for those very same things, we rejoice with her. Can that irony alone open our imaginations to the possibility that God might be hidden in things that sometimes seem so dark? Alternatively, I wonder if we're tempted to take this version of Mary's story that I've just shared, this with all of its fear and hardship, and use it to draw the conclusion that that's what God intended. That God is some master puppeteer, skillfully directing everything. And that all of the heartache and rejection and confusion and strife that Mary endured are what made Elizabeth's greeting all the sweeter. And that without those things, she would never have known the full grace of the situation. The full grace of God. I wonder if we think we can read this story and use it to read God's mind. I wonder if sometimes... We maybe even think that's the whole point of the Bible. Trying to uh, 
decipher the mysterious mind of God, to find the answer and the reason for everything that happens, that if only we could discern those things, we would be able to endure them. But what if that's not the case? What if everything doesn't happen for a reason? What if the shame Mary faced in Nazareth wasn't a part of God's plan, but simply the patriarchal attitudes of her culture causing harm? In the end, I don't think there are any satisfactory answers to any of these questions. I think that we have to wrestle with them for ourselves and take from them what we can. But as I read this story today, I wonder if maybe that's the point. Luke tells us this story about Mary, and he makes sure that we know from the beginning that God is in the story. What if he's trying to help us look at our own stories where we don't know that God is in them, and to work backwards and to find where God might be hidden in them as well? We don't like darkness. We prefer light. We prefer to see and know and understand what's going on. The scriptures are a tradition that we have received from faithful people trying to make sense of what God is up to. But at the heart of those scriptures, just as at the heart of our own stories, is the mystery of God's presence. We sometimes think that mystery means a riddle, that it exists to be unraveled. But reality, it's, it's not a riddle, it's reality to be embraced. Mystery defies explanation. All of our attempts to define or describe it, like the story I just told or the stories from Scripture, those things invite us into the mystery. They help us make some sense of it, draw some meaning from it, but they can never contain it. As I ponder this, I think about John. Little John in the story, still three months away from being born, all he knows is darkness. He is in a world completely obscured by flesh. The flesh of his mother's womb keeps him uh, keeps the outside world hidden from him. The flesh of his eyes and his ears is not yet ready to make sense of what awaits him out there. And even if they were ready, the flesh of his brain is not yet ready to comprehend those signals and translate them into meaningful information. And yet, somehow, when Mary's greeting falls on his mother's ears, even in the dark, that's enough to make him leap for joy. For those of us living in the dark, maybe John is our hope in this story. There is so much that not only can we not see or hear or comprehend, but that can't be seen or heard, that can't be comprehended. Whether because our flesh is too weak or because we are blinded by the flesh around us, all the cultural norms and societal expectations, the flawed human intentions that make up the world, we can't even conceive of what else might be out there, be out there, beyond what we know with our eyes and ears and brains. But God is here with us, just as with John, always opening us to the joy of God's mystery. Isn't that the miracle of the incarnation, after all? That God enters this flesh this obscuring stuff that keeps us from seeing God and transforms it. Transforms it from something that we call ugly and nasty and shameful into something blessed. Maybe that's as much what Advent is about as anything, right? Is expecting and welcoming God in the flesh to transform us, to transform all of this in our eyes to help us see the blessing in it.